Thank you very much, Hans. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be back here 30 years later. Uh, many familiar faces changed just a little bit. We changed just you know, a tiny little bit. Um, so when, when Hans sent me the email, he said, ah, I have to explain why wavelets were so fantastic for signal processing. Uh, so that's what I'm going to try to do. But then I, you know, I'll also tell you a few other stories. But anyway, so here is the outline. So I'm going to start where we were actually 30 years ago, which I call a tale of two communities, signal processing people and harmonic analysis people. Uh, very different communities that sort of met on this topic, and I found this very exciting. Then came what I call the Golden Age. Uh, you'll see what I call the Golden Age, and uh, that led into something that I call the Beauty and the Beast. Okay? But I don't tell you who's the Beauty, who's the Beast. The characters will be introduced as they come. And that will be a little bit the, uh, the history of the topic, as I see it, you know, which is a very biased view. Uh, of course, and then I'll tell you two stories from more recent research that we have been involved in, and I should of course give credit. This is work by the first uh, of these two technical parts is by Jan Barbotin, Reza Pariscar, and the second uh, piece de résistance is by Thierry Bleu, Pina Marzigliano, and Hanji Pan. So that will be, the first one is on time frequency scale, because that's at the heart of wavelets, and uh, we'll revisit this topic 30 years later. And then uh, is, of course, sparsity, signal processing in the age of sparsity will also give a little bit of uh, new input, I hope. And then I'll talk a little bit about the community and why it was actually successful uh, pushing this agenda to, you know, 30 years being back here and happy. Good, okay, so the two communities are signal processors and harmonic analysis people, as I announced. Um, so when I started my thesis, there was a famous guy in signal processing who was working on uh, subband coding of speech. His name was Claude Gallon, and uh, he was writing papers here on an IBM typewriter, very ugly, okay? <laughs> so it's a typewriting, I mean, the paper, you know, is what it is. And it was about something called filter banks, which were this clunky engineering devices, and that's what uh, matter was, right? And uh, as I conclude here, this looks quite boring, but that was what my thesis advisor had given me as a thesis topic, so, you know, being a good boy, that's what I worked on. But then, I w since I had done the history, I said, let me look up Claude Gallon today, okay? What happened to this guy who was at the origin of these topics? And I found uh, publicity and advertisement for IBM, 100 years of IBM, used Claude Gallon here as a poster boy, and the title is interesting, me demandez à moi si l'homme et l'ordinateur se parleront un jour, exclamation mark, because he was actually working on speech understanding for IBM, right, and speech communication and so on. And so this was hot stuff, certainly at IBM, because otherwise they wouldn't have picked him out. Of course, he also makes a good poster boy, you know. Uh, he was in Lagode, not very far from here. Okay. Now, these people were actually doing very interesting work, but from a very applied perspective. Uh, the first time that subband coding of speech was done was 1976, so it predates actually some of the wavelet work. The short time Fourier transform had been used in signal processing since the 60s, so the idea of going into a time frequency space uh, was, was also very, of course, goes back to Gabor of, fundamentally, but it was also a workhorse of many signal processing devices. Uh, perfect reconstruction filter banks was done around in the early 80s. Transform coding, Karen and Love transform, principal components, and so on, that also was around. I'm re repeating this because we'll see they come back again in the beauty and the beast. And uh, subband coding of, uh, of speech and images was also being done there. That's the earliest picture I could find from a subband decomposition, which now, of course, we would call a wavelet decomposition of an image, right? And you see all the you know, characteristics that make them still a very useful device today. Okay, harmonic analysis people, when I first came here, uh, I, I'm overstating my point, of course, but you know, it, it's, it felt like harmonic analysis people were mostly concerned with functions like this, right? Uh, which you know, are interesting objects, but to an engineer, a signal processor, it's sort of, yeah, it makes a nice illustration, but why bother, right? 
And so, of course, the, the really interesting phenomenon was that exactly at this interface where interesting things would actually happen, which I think is a lesson sort of how to do science, how to pose questions, where to go get the answers, where to get the help when you have a good question and so on. All right, now in harmonic analysis, the hard construction was known since the beginning of the uh, 20th century. Okay, that's, uh, you can look up, it's online, it's the original paper, very nice, by Alfred Haar, proving that they are wavelet bases. Okay, they are discontinuous, tough luck, but they do exist as bases for L2. Uh, there were also negative results sitting out there uh, about uh, it's the famous Balin Law theorem, which sort of said if you try to do an L2 basis with some concentration uh, with a Fourier like decomposition, you would get in trouble, right? And in some sense, that was what was blocking a little bit uh, the work using Gabor type of constructions because the limit of having a nice orthogonal basis was actually disproved by this Balin Law theorem. And uh, so in that sense, there was this, you know, uh, in incredible prize to be found, which was to have something that would have the characteristics of R because we knew it would exist and would not have the bad properties of uh, uh, what a Fourier expansion would give. And of course, I call this the meeting of the minds. The minds are here. So when Ingrid Dobschi, you know, wrote a famous 100-page uh, paper uh, in, in communications of applied math, orthogonal basis of compactly supported wavelets, when Stefan and, and Eve made, uh, you know, a framework to think about the problems, uh, many people contributed to this. And uh, in parallel, local cosine bases, which were a little bit surprising, given that there was this negative result of Balin law, it was a little bit surprising that the only trick you needed to do is to go real right? Let's be real, and you get cosine bases, and they were, you know, independently done by people in harmonic analysis and by single processing people, uh, Rico Moldar. Now, I have a little bit anecdote here. This is a beautiful picture of a palace on Long Island, and why is it connected to this? Because I was a poor, struggling assistant professor in the U.S. Uh, on a very, you know, abysmal salary, uh, but that I got the chance, I had friends, whose parent owns this mansion and would go away and needed house sitting, okay? So not a bad place. And so I remember sitting on the porch of this house, truly, and reading, you know, Ingrid's paper. So it took me a while because my background was not this sort of uh, harmonic analysis. And so I spent the time, you know, on this porch on a mansion on Long Island, and that's really how I got started on the topic. So this is a very, very sweet memory, I must say. Okay, now you all know that Stromberg had actually presented uh, a wavelet basis that was continuous in 1983. I think even, uh, even he's not here, but I think he, he, he told us that he was actually at the talk, but okay. Right, it wasn't completely clear that everybody in the room understood what had been presented, okay? Uh, but it did exist, okay? Um, now, what's very important in the wavelet construction, from my point of view, is that it always came in a constructive manner, and the constructive manner was actually about algorithms. Okay. And if you ask me why it has such an impact, it is really because they were always tied to algorithms. And if you look at the Fourier transform, if there wasn't the fast Fourier transform, we wouldn't have this huge explosion of applications of Fourier type of methods in engineering and in sciences, right? So algorithms are very tightly tied, actually, to these mathematical constructions. So, of course, they are related to filter banks. You have all sorts of constructions, especially multidimensional ones are sort of cute um, because they are very esoteric. Uh, you can do adaptive bases. And, and then there is, of course, my, uh, Stefan's algorithm, which allowed to go between continuous and, uh, and discrete in a quantitative way, and I'll come back to that when I talk about, um, about sampling. And, you know, the picture that subsumes it all is, you know, this one, right, which I, I, I think I used probably in the talk 30 years ago, okay. Um, good. The golden age. I call this when wavelets were going to cure cancer. Okay, so, you know, I'm an old guy, as you can see, so I have seen this wave of ideas that come and that then, you know, with promises, and, and it's great, right? Because it gets people excited, so we all do hard work and so on. And then, you know, we wake up one day with a hangover, okay? And then if it was really a good idea, we sort of get over the hangover, work harder and get further, right? And so I'll, I'll talk a little bit about th this because it's also for the history of you know, how we work as a community, I think it's sort of cute. Okay, so wavelets, immediately I noticed uh, mathematicians were extremely interested in applications, you know. 
And that's always, the, the grass is greener on the other side, right? The engineers are always very proud when they finally can prove a theorem, right? And the mathematicians really want to show that what the theorem they have are useful, right? But I say, wavelets are looking for applications, but applications were not waiting for wavelets. You know, engineers like Claude Galland had to fix stuff, right? To make products so IBM would distribute uh, money to their shareholders, right? So they would come up with clunky things, but they would actually work, right? And, you know, if you have a lot of people that uh, do things and, and work hard, you know, maybe they don't prove theorems, but they don't get, go too far from something that works pretty well, right? Which is example in, in machine learning, right? A lot of these things are being done by tweaking and trying, and then, you know, Stefan comes and cleans it out, right? So, <clears throat> wavelets are beautiful. So, when I looked at it, I remember because there were debates in the engineering community, you know, if this was really something for engineers, well, I said, look, they are beautiful, so they have to be studied, right? For me, this is good enough. But most important is that they created a framework to think about methods that were sitting around for a long time. Okay. And that, I think, is very important, for example, for teaching. I'll come back to this also. Because you want to, to create a mental framework about methods, not a collection of tricks, right? And there's a, the wavelet, wavelets had a tremendous impact, I think. And, um, of course, to generalize the way that Gabor did to a more general view time frequency scale was important because uh, it makes it much more flexible, right? But then there were also things, right? You could take, I was talking about the esoteric functions. So one of the standard uh, filters that was used in sp subband coding of speech is shown here iterated a few times. And because it's not, it doesn't satisfy uh, the zero at pi condition, this filter actually doesn't have, uh, doesn't convert, right? I mean, it's, uh, I, I think it's discontinuous everywhere. I forget now. I, I, I'm sure Albert knows it by heart. But so engineers were using this, and, you know, there was some problem r lurking, and they wouldn't have seen it, okay? So I really felt that the combination of the two skills was, was really very interesting. Okay. So then come a few stories. I have to tell stories. I'm sorry, because I was asked to, you know, give a review of the history of this. Um, so the first one is about Bell Labs. So Ingrid is not here. She would do it more properly. But I, but I knew the people on the other side of the corridor because she was in Murray Hill uh, in the math uh, department. And across the corridor, essentially, was a signal processing group. And the story goes that, you know, she designed the Dobshi filter. And she, you know, crossed the corridor, went to this group. I know these people. I'm not going to tell you the name. You can figure it out. And she showed the filter. And the people, you know, the signal processing, old guys from signal processing looked at the filter, and they said, this is not a filter. Okay? So <laughs> why did they say this? Because these people had spent, you know, 25 years doing optimization methods to reach, you know, the graal of the filters, which was some, you know, vision of what they thought the filter should be. And Ingrid's, you know, design had to be regular, so it had many zeros at pi. So it didn't meet this vision, right, of the filter. And so, you know, she was, you know, quite disappointed that these engineers didn't like her filters, right? But it turned out the engineers were obviously wrong, okay? Um, then there was a New York Times science section. I was in New York at the time, so I would, you know, look this up every now and then. And in a long article, you know, wavelets were going to cure cancer, essentially. But one of the things that was said is that image compression would be, invo would be improved by 100 times, okay? 100 times. And uh, then there is a story that I think Stefan also remembers. So once we were all invited to this beautiful place here, okay? So if you do multi-resolution on this place, you see this little object. So you know this is not, uh, it's not a golf club. And this was a completely surrealistic experience, right? So you show up in an Air Force base, and uh, there were people from all over, right? Uh, that the US uh, military had invited because they wanted to understand wavelets, okay? And, um, and they invited, you know, the old classical signal processing people, you know, the people that they had funded for many years, people from France, etc. Very, very interesting meeting, right? And, um, and there is the famous other story, right? Is that it's actually, I, I verified with Al Ompenheim, I really wanted to make sure. So over lunch, somebody said, oh, Rafi Koifman is going to talk about speech compressions this afternoon, and he's going to improve speech compression by a factor of 10, okay? 10 times. And Al Oppenheim said, 
okay, I bet my house against yours that this is not true. That's not going to happen, right? As far as I know, Al Oppenheim still lives in his mansion in Cambridge, Massachusetts, <laughs> so it didn't happen. So when I told the story to some collaborators of mine, they said, okay, so 100 times on images, that was in the end 2 dB, and 10 times on speech, in the end, was 1 dB. And the dB is, is a little bit, but not very much, right? It's log scale on SNR. So we'll come back to this, okay? But these stories are also interesting because they have to happen, right? Because you want good stories because that, you know, creates a community, okay? But, um, and allows you to come to the 30-year thing and tell stories. So, okay, the beauty and the beast. That's maybe important because it's also a, a, a word of care when we get carried away uh, with new inventions. And that's the story of JPEG 2000, okay? And... Um, so I asked my neighbor here in my garden, uh, this, this bird, what uh, he thought about resolution. And if you look, he said, well, tell me if you are going to take the picture with JPEG or JPEG 2000, okay? So we took it both ways. And it turns out JPEG, which is the beast, of course, is based on uh, the Karen and Love transform. The theory was done in the 60s. Actually, the earliest example is even from the, from the 50s. Transform coding is an idea from speech in the 50s. Then it was sort of adapted to images in the 60s. It's block-based. It has a fast algorithm, okay? And you can't really see it, but of course, you know why JPEG is bad, because there are blocks, right? If you really blow up the image a lot, you will see blocks. Okay? But in most applications, okay, you don't see blocks. Okay? But you can be much smarter. You can take JPEG 2000. It's based on Wavelet, so it must be good. Uh, the theory is newer, okay? new and improved. It's from the 80s. It doesn't make blocks, right? And it has a fast algorithm. And you look, indeed, you don't see the blocks because it's Wavelet, right? But the difference, you can see, is not humongous. So I said... Let me go to the web, right? The answer must be on Wikipedia. So there is a page, actually. And the amazing thing is that the page that compares JPEG to JPEG 2000, you know, sense, says something about JPEG 2000 being better, but I cannot see it, okay? Please go to the Wikipedia page, you know. I, I must be becoming very old, right? These are the pictures, that's the original, that's JPEG, that's JPEG 2000. I can't see the difference, right? Now, why is it so hard, you know, to beat uh, an old horse? Right? So currently, I think the situation is that if you have a mobile phone, you take a picture, it's going to be on JPEG. Okay? So 98% of applications of image compression is JPEG. JPEG 2000 is used in one standard, which is digital cinema. I think it's something that Dolby and the, the studios did. And it's a frame-based video compression algorithm, and they use JPEG 2000. The improvement is 1 to 2 dB, so it's not bad, but it's not 100, right? That would be 10 dB or 20. Um, and if you go to standardizations, you say, I'm going to improve things by 1 dB, people say, what next, right? I mean, they, you know, this is too much of an effort to rip out all the, you know, the things you have installed in your machines to replace it by something else for 1 dB, right? Even though JPEG has many, many nice glitzy features in terms of, appli uh, of applications, right? But the true reason, and here we come really to the history of the topic, the true reason is that it's a patent situation, okay? So believe it or not, so that's also on the, on the Wikipedia page, but of course I, I, I have heard such stories. However, the JPEG committee, which does the standardization, has acknowledged that undeclared submarine patents may still present a hazard. Okay? When you read this and you talk to a patent lawyer, he or she is not going to touch the standard with a 10-foot pole, right? And, and, okay, so let's look at these patents. Uh, you know one of these patents, right? Uh, <laughs> so that has another story, which, you know, I, I actually signed off. I wouldn't say this story, but I'm, okay, exceptionally, if you don't repeat it. Um, okay, so there is a... <laughs> so, is a <laughs> so one of the submarine patents is by... Alex Grossman, Jean Morlet, and Pierre Goupillon, right? Okay, and um, it's a 93 patent, so it's very early. And if you read the patent, I mean, it's essentially to, uh, it's very much related to, um, you know, wa continuous time wavelet decompositions, right? Now the story, I have time for a quick story, is that I didn't know this patent at all. And once I get the phone call and somebody at the other line with some deep voice sounding like a lawyer says, we are looking for uh, an expert witness for a patent case, right? And uh, I said, 
and I was just interested once to see how this works, right? So I said, oh, yeah, well, send me the patent, okay? And they said it was a wavelet pattern, it was about compression, so on. So they send me the patent, this patent, I read it, and I say, I don't see the relationship, you know, of this with compression. The lawyer says, that's not the question. We will decide if there is a relationship. <laughs> 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 and this was a completely surrealistic experience, <laughs> I have to confess, right? Me reading this thing and thinking, yeah, nice math, you know, could be used for, I don't know what, uh, you know, some transform analysis or something. And they're saying, yeah, but, you know, if in this sentence we would think that this word actually means that, then could it be applied on a compression standard, right? And the rest is probably history, Alex knows the rest. I, at some point, you know, had other things to do. But, you know, that's a reason, real reason why JPEG 2000 didn't take off, unfortunately, because it's a, it's a much better standard. Okay, so what have we learned from signal processing, from the wavelet experience? Sorry, we, we cannot really see this, but you know what's there. We have learned how to deal with piecewise smooth functions. We have learned how to deal with fancier norms than signal-to-noise ratio, which is L2. We learned about nonlinear approximation, which was being used but was not called like this in compression because all the compression standard, if you look how JPEG works, it's a nonlinear approximation standard. So we learned a lot of stuff, right? And we learned that you could take signals which would be, I don't know, harmonics, and it, they would be noise-like, and they would be piecewise polynomial. You feed them into wavelets, and they essentially see you make a good compromise in extracting the structure of this signal, right? And this has been extremely important, maybe the most famous application, of course, uh, of course spearheaded by Dave Donohoe and his co-workers, is in denoising, which is a very, very immediate application of this, and the beauty is that you can prove that it actually works, okay? Again, denoising methods where you would threshold the high pass had been used, actually, but they weren't understood, okay? And this gives a framework to think about this problem. Of course, denoising is sort of the simplest inverse problem you can think of, and so that, of course, was the beginning of the st sparsity story. Okay, so I sort of said already what's here, lessons learned, you know, Signal processing people learned about f fancier norm, about esoteric spaces, which are actually useful, and sparsity became an explanation principle for many methods that were sort of potentially ad hoc. Okay? And I look at them more like my view is that you know, Fourier diagonalizes convolution operators, so it's very useful everywhere where you have shift invariants, linear time invariant systems, and so on. And wavelets sort of pseudo diagonalize, because there is nothing that is really diagonalized by wavelets that are more rich than the, the Fourier type of, uh, of objects. And for me, what's beautiful is that it comes with solid theory, of course, that you know, and it comes with very efficient algorithms. So from that point of view, it has made a, a huge difference in signal processing. Okay, so that was sort of the uh, looking back in the rear uh, mirror. So let me tell you about two stories. One is a time frequency story, I maybe not spend too much time, and the other one is a sampling story, and these are current, uh, two of the current projects we have in the lab. Um, I already mentioned this, these are the two views of the world. At the heart of it, of course, is the uncertainty principle, right? And in continuous time, the uncertainty principle is, you know, a very well-known and, and old result, goes back to, to physics of the earliest 20th century, to Gabor and so on. And Heisenberg says, okay, if you define spread as a second moment, then there is a lower bound, and the lower bound is met by the Gaussian. Okay, end of story there. Then you go to discrete time, and you're surprised to discover that even though everything is done in discrete time, the, the grounding of the uncertainty principle in discrete time is actually shaky. Okay? May, maybe Hans will correct me, but when we looked at it, we couldn't find much. I'll review a little bit what there was. But, you know, how do we define time frequency spread? What is the uncertainty bound? What are the minimizers? Okay? So all three things that are very, very well known and are the basis of everything we do in time frequency scale analysis in discrete times are actually not, as far as we could see, uh, as properly defined. Okay, so if you do... Discretization, you just say, let me take the definition in continuous time, discretize it, you get something that is not very good, okay? Because obviously, uh, the spectrum in discrete time is periodic, so you cannot take a non-periodic uh, definition of variance. So you can go there and, you know, scratch your head a little bit, and it turned out 
you better use the first trigonometric moment. The argument is uh, relatively simple. So the spread uh, or the localization in frequency, you bring it back in time, it's momentum. If you discretize the momentum, you get second order finite difference. You go back to Fourier and you get a measure of spread here, which is periodic, which is two, one minus cosine omega. We can compare what uh, the usual spread would be, that's the, uh, the, the, the quadric, versus uh, the first trigonometric moment. And the first trigonometric moment, of course, doesn't have a discontinuity here. So if you take this as the definition of frequency spread, we are in periodic frequency, then uh, and that's a, no, a known result from the 80s. Weitenberg, I think, was the first uh, to prove it. Then you have a lower bound, which looks very much like Heisenberg. OK, so you're happy, you say. It's Heisenberg all over again. But then you discover that this lower bound is very weak. Okay, because it says one quarter is here, then you discretize Gaussians, and Gaussians you know, will give you time frequency spreads according to this new measure, which are very far away from the lower bound. Very far away. So there is a huge gap, right? So whoever could find a function or a sequence, which would turn into a periodic function in frequency, that would be here, would become very famous, right? Because the gap is so big. Or the gap is very weak. All right? And so we, we got sort of obsessed with this, right? Because uh, we were sort of annoyed that you know, there was this huge territory unexplored as far as we could see. There was one result which said when the frequency spread goes to zero, then the it will be tight here. Okay, but that's not very interesting. Frequency spread going to zero is a Dirac, and that's you know, uh, not, you know, not your ideal filter. What you want is things which are somewhere in between a Dirac and, and the constant, right? Um, OK, so there is this question, what happens in between? So it turned out you can pose this, uh, you can come up with bounds, I'm going to show them, and you can pose the question of minimizers as a semi-definite programming problem. It takes a little bit of a while, but what you can do is you can say, you know, give me a frequency spread you would like, OK? Let's say two and a half. Then I'm going to optimize the sequence that minimizes the time frequency spread. Okay? And the minimizer can be found from a semi-definite program here. So numerically, it's not a difficult task. And you have you know, different operators here. You have a, a differencing operator. And it will give you the filter, okay? which is you know, what we are looking for in discrete time signal processing. And here is an example. Let's say you want a frequency spread here of 1 tenth. And you optimize, you find, you know, we are close to the bound, but you know, we are not at 2.5, right? We're a little bit above. The result is this is the function in frequency, this is the sequence in time. Now you're looking at this and you're saying, this looks like a Gaussian, doesn't it, right? Okay. Um, it is not. I'm happy to announce, okay? It's something else. So the Fourier transform of this object, the maximally compact sequence, is a so-called Mathieu function, which I didn't know before we were working on this, okay? It turned out it's, of course, not very far from Gaussians, I'll be honest with you. Uh, but what's interesting is that we have much more interesting bounds. So there is a lower bound which says nothing exists. That's an analytical lower bound. Nothing exists here. Okay, so there is no huge gap, there is no you know, million dollar prize to be won here by some new glitzy sequence. Um, there is an analytical upper bound, okay? and then there is a no man's land here, except that using this numerical method, we found a numerical bound here that says nothing is below this. Okay? And uh, so, of course, you know, if somebody is, is willing to fill in this with you know, an analytical bound, I'm very happy. Right now, this is based on this semi-definite programming uh, formulations that I showed before. OK. Now, there is a significant gap between Gaussians and what we find here, Mathieu functions. Significant if, in the tradition of wavelets, you zoom in you know, strong enough. Okay? So you can see <laughs> the discretized Gaussian is here, and the lower bound is here, which is met by the Mathieu functions. And if you zoom, yes, they are not the same. right? So this is slightly disappointing, except that now we know there is nothing to be found there, okay? which to mathematicians must be very good. To engineers, it's a little bit frustrating, I have to say. All right, now what's also interesting, you can take all these filters that people had designed, including the, the neighbors of Ingrid Dobschi, you can put them there. Some of them are very good, but others are very bad, actually. 
okay? in terms of time frequency spread. So it might be good for something else. Okay? And maybe the most important thing is that this uh, semi-definite programming formulation is also very useful because it's a starting point where you can put other constraints. Right? You can say, I would like to be you know, uh, you know, uh, localized in time, localized in frequency, and something else. Right? You know, finite lengths or something, and then you can find the best filter that will satisfy this, while satisfying time frequency constraint. Okay, so that was about one classic domain of uh, wavelets, which is time frequency. The other one is sparsity, and I, what I'm going to tell you is what I call sampling 2.0. I had to find the titles. I was done in the TGV this morning, so you know, pardon me if that's uh, sort of too obvious. But it's a sampling question, okay? And the sampling question is inherent in wavelets, except in the end, you know, except for Stefan Zalgren, which sort of says how you can do it. But in practice, you actually never do sampling using wavelets. Why? Because you don't have a physical device that by magic actually has a wavelet in it, right? It has some clunky sink or whatever, or one of these filters from the friend of England, right? But anyway, sampling is absolutely fundamental, and the, it's a very simple setup. You have continuous time functions, you have observation kernels, which, you know, maybe compute a projection or something else. You take samples, and uh, from the samples you would like to know what you know about the original function. So this bijection, you know, when is there a one-to-one -one relationship between x of t and the samples is as all the signal processing communication information theory goes back to actually, I'll have a history slide. But to me, it's this fundamental question when you do anything, signal processing, image processing, but beyond this, where you have a physical reality which is continuous, and you have a representation in the computer where you do machine learning, extrapolation, interpolation, etc. Okay? And, you know, it's analog to digital and back. Okay? So lots of people have lots of results about going one way, right? That's the easy part. The hard part is to know exactly when this is a faithful representation of that. And this is all over the place. Many people do this without knowing they ask the question. Okay? And, um, okay. so, and of course, you know the, the history of the Shannon sampling theorem. Um, you know, he's a lucky guy. I mean, he did fantastic things. But on, on sampling, there were many other people, right? But we still, at least in the you know, English-speaking world, he's still called the Shannon sampling theorem. But here you have the history. It's such an important theorem that you had even a team of fathers and sons working on it, OK? Uh, and you know, every time I go around, I come to a new country, I make sure I find if somebody has proven the sampling. So I went to Japan. Sure enough, there is this fellow, Someya, 1949, proved the sampling theorem, right? The guy who never gets credit is this guy, uh, Herbert Rabe, because he was in Berlin in 1938. That was the wrong place, the wrong time to prove anything to get credit. Okay? All right, so choose you know, location, location, right? Timing and location, I guess. Okay, so what does the sampling theorem say? It says if you have a subspace, you know, take inner products and you'll be happy. Now, this is, you know, to Hilbert space people, you know, this is completely trivial. What frustrates me is that, I call this a nightmare that keeps me up at night, is that you give me a band-limited function, very smooth, right? And the devil comes and puts a step inside, right? And then the function, of course, is not band-limited and you're dead, right? At the same time, you think, come on, the devil just picked a time instant plus a step size. That cannot be so complicated. Give me a few more samples and I'll figure it out, right? But that's truly what we were obsessed with, okay? And the reason is that, in uh, applications, actually, but also in real life, many things are very far from band limited. Okay? So one thing that is band limited is speech and music. That's actually where the sampling theorem was proven. Shannon needed this for speech processing of all things because he was working at Bell Labs, working for AT&T, who was printing money from telephony. Right? But everything else I can think of, actually, is not band limited. And the one thing that you'll see, it's an obsession, is images. Right? So images are very far from band limited and to sort of to, to, to put them into this straight jacket of band limitedness is really a perversion okay let me use strong words here okay because I'll, I'll say where we should go next right so we we'll take a woodcut right I mean this is has you know smooth contours but you know but very sharp edges right so that's very far from band limited but also in communications we do this in you have natural processes and so on Okay, so in the end we said, is there something beyond this classic subspace view of the world? And we sort of decided, we started by looking at 
the worst case, right? What could be the worst case? Instead of smooth functions, you take Dirac's, right? And uh, so we have this archetypal signal on which we can prove something. So that's why uh, I like it as an archetypal generate non band limited signal. It has unknowns, which are time instants and, and values of the Dirac's. Okay. And we got into this classic setup. We have these Dirac's enter an observation kernel, so it's a continuous time function here. If you don't have a sampling kernel, you won't see anything, okay? So it's good that we have a sampling kernel. And you take number of samples, and you would like to show things like, is there a one-to-one -one map? Are there algorithms? Because I'm interested in algorithms. Can you reconstruct, in particular, is it well-posed or ill-posed? Will you survive noise? And if you survive, how close are you to the optimum? Okay? So these are very, very simple questions. So we spent quite a bit of time working on this. The reason I bring it here is not so much because I want to bore you with this set of results, but it, it comes back to my personal history and my interaction with the, uh, with the wavelet uh, field. Okay. Good. So in, in 2002, we had a paper with Thierry Bleu and Pina Marziliano that I mentioned, uh, which sort of showed that this is actually a very simple problem. Okay. Of course, the minute we said it's a very simple problem, somebody said, yeah, of course, because Baron de Prony solved the problem in uh, 1783, right? And that's miraculous, because he was a Baron and he survived the French Revolution, right? So to him, that was a simple result, right, compared to that. Uh, anyway, so because this problem, of course, you think about it for a split second, you say, well, let's go to Fourier, you know, Dirac's will be complex exponential, and complex exponential have been hunted for centuries, right? Uh, Prony, Euler, and so on, right? I think the only slight twist is that we pose it as a sampling problem, which was not necessarily how people were looking at it. And, uh, and the beauty is that once we have these mechanics, this, this, these tools on board, which I'm not going to describe, you can, you can extend it to quite a number of other interesting signals, piecewise polynomials, for example, which are also popular in, in wavelets. And, and it's always the same story. That's a piecewise um, linear signal with discontinuities. You observe it here with a sync kernel. You get the smoothed version. You pick out a correct number of samples, which is slightly more than what we call the rate of innovation, which is degrees of freedom of the signal, and you can actually reconstruct. Um, it has a polynomial complexity algorithm in the noiseless case. In the noisy case, you have to use more fancy methods, of course. Uh, but this is, you know, something that can be done. And it still has one surprising, to me, uh, it contains a surprising result, right? Because the original sampling theorem of Shannon says, okay, if stuff is not band-limited, you'll have to project onto the subspace of band-limited signals. You apply Shannon, and you can reconstruct on the subspace, right? What this theorem says is that, of course, uh, the set of Dirac's is not a subspace, it's a manifold, okay? And so it says, take the manifold, which is, you know, something in very high dimension, 2K dimensions when you have K Dirac's with K uh, amplitudes, compute a projection onto the subspace of band-limited signals, which is what we did here. We, co we computed the projection by having an observation kernel, which is an ideal low-pass filter, and... Um, so CRM says there is a one-to-one -one relationship. Now that this convoluted you know, manifold would project in, uh, in a way that is one-to-one, -one, that I think is still surprising and interesting. I'm sure it is, you know, uh, you guys are much smarter than this. I think it has much, much more general value than this particular case. Okay, now is this important? Well, we are still at it, right? So the original problem, of course, is high dimensional. Because in one dimension, band limitedness is okay, I can live with it. In higher dimensions, it is not. And you all know what I call the tyranny of the pixel, right? You have a nice picture, and you say, oh, let me look at this more carefully, and the next thing you see are pixels, right? And pixels are a perversion to images, right? Because it's absolutely, it's like the opposite of what you want to see when you have an edge, right? And so it turns out we are still extending these tools to two dimensions, which is much, much harder, actually, of course. That's not going to be Prony's method, I'm afraid. But uh, initial results, uh, it's actually more than initial results by Hanji Pan and Thierry, Thierry Bleu, show that you can actually do, here it's a classic super resolution, you have some you know, low resolution image, you want to blow it up. And if you use ideas that come actually from this finite rate of innovation, um, as a regularizer, you can actually get very sharp images, you know, 
substantially better than the methods that are currently used. Okay. That's, of course, the other classic inverse problem. It's super resolution. Everybody dreams of it. It's very, very ill-posed. So you need actually nonlinear methods. Anything linear will actually uh, give, give you something like this. Okay, now the irony of that story is the following. So we were working, you know, as a single processor, you saw I, where I came from, from this Claude Gallon stuff, you know, block diagrams and sequences. So I worked very hard to, you know, to mature from small L2 into a big L2 guy, right? A big guy, right? So everything now is continuous, it's so much more beautiful and so on. And so we develop a theory of sparsity in continuous time or space. That's an inverse problem on the diffusion equation where you try to find locations of sources of heat, okay? So beautiful on the plane, etc. You can put analytical formulas, etc. And while we work very hard at this, compressed sensing comes around, which is a theory of sparsity you know, in RN. Now, now, RN is nice, right? But, you know, give me a break, right? So, <laughs> so, anyway, so we worked very hard at the theory of sparsity in continuous time, and I still think this is very interesting, because, the, you know, the, the real challenge is the story about the interaction between the continuous world that we try to observe and what we can do on computational devices using algorithms and then say something about the real physical world. Okay. Good. So I'll, I'll take 30 seconds and I'm done uh, to sort of thank actually the community that has made this very interesting. I didn't list everybody. I sort of, you know, did a, a list of people that crossed my mind, but you recognize all these people. There are a few people from signal processing that were very active and, and very nice. It's also a very nice community. You know, I, I, I have also another job. I see some other communities. This one is very nice, okay? Uh, and and that makes it attractive, right? And, uh, and it's, you know, it's questions of trying to solve problems, right? Trying to look forward, and that, I think, is a cool thing about wavelets. And then I had uh, you know, a number of people over the years I interacted with, I call this the, the wavelet and signal processing gang, and more to come, probably. And um, what do I conclude from all this, right? Um, okay, I have two uh, quotations. Wavelets brought a new understanding of known methods. And the quotation, you'll appreciate since you're French, understanding is a lot like sex. It's got a practical purpose, but that's not why people do it normally. Okay, so, <laughs> so, wavelets, <laughs> so, so wavelets really brought understanding, and that's why it's so important, okay, fundamentally. The other one is a quote from Al Oppenheim, a fellow who still lives in his mansion in uh, uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts. So he, in this exchange of email, we, we sort of debated, you know, what had happened and so on. And in the end, he said, as new developments emerge in any field, it's important to let them mature without generating unrealistic expectations. So that the beautiful and important aspects have time and good soil in which to blossom. Now, in our case, it still happened, right? But it's, it's clear that, you know, if we raised expectations too much, there can be a backlash. And somehow here, we, you know, we were making, you know, we were dreaming, and some of the dreams actually happened, and so it turned out very well, okay? The other thing is that it completely changed my view of signal processing. You know, you could see where I came from. So, you know, product placement, cheap one, but uh, we ended up writing a book which we call Foundation of Signal Processing, which is really this Hilbert Space view of signal processing. It just came out. Some of you have seen it. We will see. I hear nobody reads books anymore. So, you know, when I tell my kids I'm writing books, you know, they look at me with a strange face, right? Um, and the other thing I got from the story is that I have a collection of nice T-shirts, right? Uh, and that's always good if you want to go for a run. All right. Thank you very much. <laughs>